She's like, these are the standard tests that we need to run. And I'm like, but cardio doesn't care. <laughs> I like that we're running a bake club and one of us has had a stroke, one of us has had a heart attack, and one yep, of us is absolutely. mortally obese. So I just kind of go, <laughs> <laughs> we are the poster child for bake club. <laughs> You're listening to Fussy Cutters Club Podcast, a show that gives you permission to cut into the good fabric so you can make quilts you love. And now your host, who believes it's not a crime to love using novelty fabrics, Ange Wilson. Well, Fussy Cutters, today we're back with our second meeting of the Bakers Club. I am starting to think that we are going to have to change our name because I still haven't baked from the book and... Sam and Kath have been <laughs> baking but slowing down in their baking due to life commitments and Kath's about to come to Australia, Sam's about to go off on her embroidered journey. It is just, it's funny. But we're still meeting together, we're still talking all things cooking. I have recommitted to making bakes from the book, so be prepared. And yeah, it's just a really fun conversation with two of my favorite people. And I hope that you enjoy this insight into our take on baking flavor profiles and whether there can be such a thing as too much sugar. Let's get chatting. Today, we're having episode two of our Bake Club, and I'm joined with the ever fabulous Sam Hunter of Hunter's Design Studio and Kath from Wombat Quilts. Kath, I just realized that you to me are like Madonna. You have no last name. You're just Kath. Um, so, <laughs> ladies, we <laughs> to talk snacking bakes. Now, I am going to preface it with the most exciting news ever. I was listening to Smartless Podcast last week and catching up on episodes, and Jake Gyllenhaal was on there talking about the Amazon remake of Roadhouse. I think it's a remake, more a, an extension of the Roadhouse franchise. Anyway, I digress, but Jake was talking on the podcast, and I forget how they got onto it. Oh, I think they are talking about diet, how to get lean and fit for movies and stuff, and he was talking about having to put on weight and he quoted Snacking Cakes as one of his favourite cookbooks. <laughs> and I was like, Jake, you're with us. And then I said to my husband, do you think Jake would consent to coming on a Bake Club episode to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> to talk about cake. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I wouldn't objectify him at all. So, yeah, so I was like, very excited because I feel like we're now seven degrees of baking from Jake Gyllenhaal. But yes. But have we forgiven him for the Taylor Swift stuff? What Taylor Swift stuff? Wow, I'm really out of that loop too. <laughs> <laughs> Did you date Taylor Swift? Am I the last yeah. person in the world that isn't tracking what Taylor Swift is up to? Uh, Other it than might just be- changing <laughs> voting in the United States. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I only know because, you know, I've got a I've got a, a daughter who is a Swifty. But yeah, in two thousand and eleven I believe that they were a thing. And there's something about a scarf and he did the dirty on her and she wrote a song about it. And the Swifties know and the Swifties have not forgiven. Oh. Yeah, well, we'll have to sneak that question in amongst the what do you prefer, all-purpose flour or self-raising flour? <laughs> and by the way, what happened to Taylor? Your dog. Um, yeah. Wow. Well, uh, he dropped, I, I mean, he has an age. He never dates above a certain age even as he gets older. Actors aside, and as much as we love the acting profession, we love baking more. So, fellas, have you been baking? A little yes. bit. I have, you see, Kath has people to feed it to, Uh, whereas in my world, I'm the only person eating it, (laughs) and there's only so much of that one can do, (laughs) or one should do. I don't know. I mean, I would would eat that much cake, but yeah, 
I don't, I don't think that would work. So I take it to work. And sometimes I will take two or three different things to work, like <laughs> boxes and boxes of stuff. The most I've taken is four different types of cookies to work. Wow. And I get feedback, and um, it's fascinating to see what gets eaten quickly and what doesn't. I ventured last week outside of the book and did a stuffed cookie for the first time. So I did a snickerdoodle stuffed with caramel. Sorry, can we just – And so when you – For Tracy in Ohio – a stuffed cookie, is that is an Oreo considered a stuffed cookie where you have two sides and the thing in the middle or is no, a stuffed cookie? an Oreo. Stuffed cookie is the one where you put a drop in the middle? An Oreo is a filled cookie. A filled. Yeah. Uh, well, a s- Oreo is a filled yep. cookie because you've got two cookies and you've got a yep. filling. A stuffed cookie, you make the cookie dough, you make it flat and you put – I put a caramel in the middle and wrapped the dough around Ooh, it. Oh, it's a cookie dumpling. So the cookie looked like, yeah, the cookie looked like a normal cookie until you opened it up and then it had caramel in it. I'm going to need a moment. Those, yeah, I, I made two dozen of them. Only 11 of them made it to work and I'm oh not eating gosh. sugar at the moment. So between... My daughter and my husband and my grandson, they got devoured. And then they lasted uh, quite literally, I put the container down with a little sticky note of what it was, went and put my bag in the locker, put my, got my devices and stuff to start work, and they were gone. So probably <laughs> four minutes. Okay. Because it went out over the radio that they were really good and everyone just kind of got <laughs> So I'm now on a stuffed cookie. We've got. I want to stuff. All we've my got cookies. a code caramel in aisle six. Code caramel for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> the cookies have landed. Is uh, is usually what uh, goes out. <laughs> well, oh, that's yeah, lovely. I I've been feeding our Sunday night Bible study. I made I have like I haven't made anything from the book. I've been making all this other stuff. I made key lime bars, I think she called them. So Oh not, yum. Not a pie as such, but a um a bar. And so uh, mm-hmm. we don't get graham crackers in Australia, but I Googled and bless Google, it said that a McVitie's digestive a packet of those with a tablespoon of sugar is the same as a graham cracker. And No, it's not. They lie. Well, I've got graham crackers because you can buy graham crackers here at specialty like at a specialty deli, but it's like twenty four dollars for a box, right? So it, it's not worth it. Just use digestive. Exactly. So I used the McVitie's this time and quite frankly, I thought they were nicer than the graham crackers. But I think that's a an Australian yeah. preference. Not, not an actual. Like I think that's a personal. Oh, I thing. would, I would be tempted to try that next time I need a graham cracker crust. I'd go get some digestive. Yeah, so, but the tablespoon of sugar add, is important. Hmm. I'd also add a sprinkling of cinnamon. Oh, oh. I don't know whether I could do cinnamon with lime though. That might be too because the key lime. So it's basically yeah. a base of like biscuit base. Then it's a layer mm-hmm. of the key lime cheesecakey mix. Then it's a mm-hmm. layer of a whipped cream kind of thing, and then uh, zested lime over the top. It was really lovely. The cream, I forget now. Like we'll have the recipes in all the show notes, but the cream has stuff added to it, so it's not quite a French cream, but it's. It's got like powdered icing sugar and something else, vanilla maybe. But it's set. It's set like I'd never seen it set in like a layer. So um, we had that Mm -hmm. for a Bible study and it was declared too sweet by the majority of imbibers. So I, on the other hand, ate it all. (laughs) But yes, so we did that. Yeah, I can I can imagine 
that that would end up being very sweet. I mean, well, as I, as I'm always saying, there's a, the American palate is a lot sweeter. Yeah. It's a lot sweeter than, than other things. A European palate or British, all that kind of stuff. I'm just trying to figure, find the one that I made. Mind you, I've been reducing the sugar and everything. <clears throat> I take at least 25 to 30% of the sugar out whenever I make anything out of these books, if I can. Because it just doesn't need yeah. it. A lot of the times it just doesn't need it's it. It's funny, right? Because um, I don't cook. If I want it with salt, and my dad's always like, you don't salt enough. And I'm like, hmm. Hmm. A chubby lady. Yeah, salt. But you can put that on at the table later. That's what I think. And we offer a couple of different versions of salt on the table. But yes. Yeah. Sorry, Kath. Yeah. No, I was going to say, um, if I want to bake something that's not as sweet, I'll do an Australian recipe yeah. versus an American recipe. Have you made Anzac biscuits and taken them to work? Yes. Probably about a year or so ago, uh, a store, was it over a year, Sam? New Seasons, one of our local grocery stores, did got rid of all its maple, uh, not maple syrup, its golden syrup. We've got Lyle's Golden Syrup. And between Sam and I, we hit up, I think, four <laughs> different uh, new yeah, we seasons. we bought it out. <laughs> we bought it out. So I still have about eight to ten bottles of Golden Syrup. So I'm not skimpy on that. And Antac Biscuits, they're, um, they're seen as healthy. Oh. Oh, what yeah. are they? What are they? I don't I don't think I know them. So they're golden syrup, oat, flour, flour? Golden syrup, oats, yep. flour, sugar, brown sugar? Brown sugar. Uh, usually brown sugar. Brown sugar. Yeah, now I got that stone song in my head. There but you go. they they originated from the so they get their name and they originate from the Anzac, so Australia and New Zealand Army Corps. It's the biscuits they used to make in I think it was World War One and World War Two. Um yes. and World War One. They the thing is they last if you don't eat them, they last for ages. Um and they were able to be baked and sent like Okay. Um and so women would send them to the front line and stuff like that. Um, and they became a treat, like a, um, I'll link to, someone's Ooh. probably written the history about it, I'll link to it. So, Sam, have you ever had those millionaire shortbreads that I made? Yeah. I went through a phase of making them. Okay, so those are an Anzac biscuit millionaire shortbread. So they have an Anzac oh, biscuit okay. on the bottom and then uh-huh. caramel and chocolate on top. Yeah. So, yeah, as much shortbread as I make, I mean, I'm known as shortbread, Sam. I don't make millionaire shortbread, um, mostly because I don't have a great relationship with making the toffee, the caramel. Um, Neither do I contestants have a really tough on time Top getting Chef. It consistent. <laughs> if someone's going to burn well, something on Top well, Chef, I mean, it's usually caramel or risotto. Caramel. That's Hell's Kitchen. Yeah. Risotto is Hell's Kitchen. They make <laughs> Never make it properly, according to Gordon mm-hmm. Ramsay. But yeah, caramel's one. Of, oh, the Great British Bake Off. Caramel has often been the downfall of people on Great British Bake Off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, getting that- the consistency that it'll set up, right? Yeah. You know, because on a millionaire shortbread, it has to, it has to, it has to not crunch, but it has to set up well enough to cut. But but at Christmas time, uh, I was given a stirring spatula that has a thermometer down it inside the head of the spatula. Yep. Um, and I'll get you a link for that if you want it. And I, I've yet to use it, but I have one now. <laughs> so, <laughs> I heard about them and then I went and got one, but I haven't made anything that required it. Kath, do you have a caramel trick? Candy thermometer. A thermometer? Mm. Yeah. Like use a thermometer. If you're, if you're struggling, use a thermometer. But the other one is... If you think you've cooked it long enough, cook it for an extra minute. Okay. Because you've never cooked it long enough. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. No, I'm, I make it all the time. I don't struggle with it as much as 
other members Some of our people. group. <laughs> yeah. Other members of our group. But this is – Yeah, she was ducking when she said I that. I don't make caramel. I use caramel in a tin from Nestle. Do you guys get that over there? Oh. If you don't, I'll send some. No. Because it is – We so get – Do you do condensed milk in a tin, Nestle condensed milk? Yes, we get yeah. condensed milk. And I have a friend who will actually boil the condensed milk in the tins and turn it into dulce de leche. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. So caramel yeah. in a tin from and Nestle, that- you eat it with a spoon from the tin as a kid in the oh. same way you would eat condensed milk when your mum was finished with the condensed milk tin. But, yeah. And all it is is condensed it, – it's exactly the same thing. It's condensed milk that's been cooked to caramelise. Cooked. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I did have another question. I did. Oh, that was my thing. I baked a lemon and coconut gluten free cake from um, recipe. It was tin eats. Freaking awesome! Um, because we had Christy from Quiet Play came up to visit, and she's gluten free. And so, I always love the opportunity to cook something that's that everyone can eat. And I can tell you now, one of the easiest and nicest cakes I've made in a long time. It was made with almond meal. I loved it. I've made it a couple times. Um, I made it for the pub crowd and they really liked it. And then I made it on a sewing day when a couple of my friends came over and normally my friends will have a slice and they'll rave about it and they'll come back for another slice. And they were incredibly polite and didn't come back for seconds. So I don't think it worked for them. But I think probably the major reason it didn't work is it's not that sweet. Yeah. It's not a very sweet cake. But it's lovely. Oh. I think it's lovely. It's a really great coffee cake. I was thinking it would be really me. good with a lemon drizzle or a lemon syrup. You know when you put a lemon syrup over yeah. a cake? That was my thing. I was yeah. thinking if you wanted to make it a little bit more decadent, I mm-hmm. guess. But I really love recipetineats.com for all of her recipes. And I think we spoke about her last time too, but, yeah. We Mm -hmm. did. I've actually, going back, circling back to the book that we're meant to be baking (laughs) on. No (laughs) offence. Last week I did bake the lemon poppy seed (gasps) cake out of that book, Um, except I didn't have any lemons, so I used oranges. yeah. So it's oh, an, yummy. It, it was an orange, almond, and poppy seed cake, and mm. it wasn't overly sweet. I didn't think, like I took the cake to work, and I didn't think anyone would eat it. I took it the same day I took the caramel stuffed cookies, mm-hmm. but it got eaten, and it got eaten pretty quickly. I think that that cake would have benefited from a drizzle. Yeah. It was, mm-hmm. it was in need of something. So I'm going to well, do it again and I'm going to put a drizzle yeah. on this next time. I found that when the cakes are written for lemon or lime and you tr- and you switch to orange, it's like it, it doesn't have the bite, so it needs something else. Cream cheese frosting. Well, like the lemon and the lime ha- have, you know, have a little bit of kick, but the orange is really smooth and it's like it, it – it misses something. Cream there. cheese frosting. I love so the she, flavor, but it's like it needs to be cream cheese frosting. Oh yeah, cream cheese frosting. In, cream in cream the cheese book, frosting. she actually in the book she actually has an orange version of it in the uh-huh. yeah, yeah do a different yeah. version. And I doubled the amount of probably tripled the amount of zest I put in. Oh yeah, um, always. It's uh, never enough. But particularly if you're using orange over lemon, you want to mm. up that zest. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was nice. I I mean. It just wasn't singing for me. It wasn't sweet enough. Yeah. Um, I decided to uh, stop torturing myself with the cookie recipes because that 30-second window between raw and burned is not anything. I do not have skill for that. Um, And I kept making these cookies that I felt like the batter tasted great, but the cookies were kind of like, okay. Um, I mean, not that everybody at the pub didn't snarf them. I mean, they, they went. But when I moved to the bars, so I did um, the coffee glazed molasses bars and the peanut butter blondie bars. Um, and on the peanut butter blondie bars, I found tiny miniature 
peanut butter cups from Trader Joe's and put those in there. And those got rave reviews. Yep. The crowd loves peanut butter. They love the molasses coffee vibe. They're really, really happy with anything in that in that lane. So I like that you admitted to eating the batter because I think there is a <clears throat> batch of cookies. I always taste it to see what's going There's on. There's a batch of cookies yeah. that I make that I never bake. I just make for the batter. Oh, I'm not a cookie dough person, but you know you got to taste it while it's going to see if which it needs reminds something. me. You know, I am going to share with you a link to a recipe, and forgive me for the name. I didn't name it, so um, but this is going to get us our E rating for this episode. It's called a slutty brownie, right? And it's got five okay. layers, and one of the layers is cookie, and one of the layers is uh-huh. brownie. And I'm going to send it to you guys. And if if your audience that you share your baking with doesn't think that you've been baking sweet enough, wait till you try these. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I bet my people will love yeah. them. You just need a, a an eight inch by eight inch pan, so it's not like a big mm-hmm. big thing. And mm-hmm. ironically, the woman, if my memory serves me, the woman who invented them is a British. She's a British food blogger, and you can make it mm-hmm. all with cake mix packs. Like, because I think it's like a cookie mix, a brownie mix, a cake mix, or something like. Yeah. Anyway, I'll send you the link. Okay. So, do you guys know what a trepumple cake is? No. Is that like a tadurkin? Yes, it is like a cake version of a tadurkin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so Charles Phoenix, he's. Um, Oh, he does these amazing slideshows. He started his career doing slideshows based from slides that he would pick up at thrift stores and and swap meets and car boot sales and all of that kind of stuff. And he just like puts these slideshows together and points out the hysterical humor in a lot of them. And he's got something called called the Charles Phoenix Test Kitchen. And he's got some really, really wacky food in it. One of them is a Velveeta snowman covered in cream cheese that you put him in a hot dish and he melts and he turns into queso. But the Chirpumpel cake, there's a cherry cake, an apple cake, and a pumpkin cake. And yeah, these are all cakes that you buy in the freezer section. You cook them and then you've got a boxed cake mix. I think there's a chocolate and a white and a spice cake or a carrot cake. And you sink the pie in the cake and bake the cake layer and then stack these three things up. So you've got pie in cake times three layers. Mm. I've threatened to make one. I never have. They look like they're not going to, it'll be like the leaning tower of cake is how it looks. Okay. You should really see their faces. (laughs) Kath and Ange are looking at me like I have completely lost my marbles. (laughs) And they've got that look like, ooh, that's a very American thing. We're not going to be doing the very American thing. Um, So, yeah. Anyway, now I need to go make one. Yeah. Now I need to go make one. I got invited to a slutty food party a couple weeks ago where we were all supposed to bring the sluttiest of food that we could imagine. So, and as it happened, the party party didn't come off. The principles were not well that day. But it's still waiting for us to have a slutty food party. Party. Well, I, so we're inspiring slutty food parties. Yeah. So I just did a quick Google, and it and it has three layers. We gave it a fourth layer uh, because we put icing on it. But it's cookie dough, okay. like a co- chocolate chip cookie base, vanilla and chocolate. Cookie. Then a layer mm-hmm. of Oreos, then a layer of brownie batter, and you bake it all together. Okay. So, but I'll make some. Well, we'll talk about it at the next bake club. But yeah. I actually thought of you yesterday, Sam. I mean, I think of you often, but yesterday particularly because a gentleman came up in my Instagram Explore Reels and he was making a tuna, tinned tuna jelly ring moldy salad Land. thing. No, it was, and I was just like, that is rank. Mm-hmm. And I know just the person who would love to see this. Who would love it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, a little background, people. I have an obsession with old pamphlet cookbooks. 
And I have a lot of them that have very odd Jello recipes in them. Jello for the Americans, jelly for the British and um, Australian audiences. And last year at Christmas time, for all my friends, I found twelve of the most outlandish, disgusting Jello recipes and put them in a calendar and gave them to people. Yeah. Well, this gentleman, he was very. Yeah. I wish at the time I was distracted and doing something else that I had followed him because he was cooking in. Chinos, a plaid shirt, and a bow tie. Like he just looked so, <laughs> mm-hmm. I want to say professional, but that's not it. Oh, I don't, proper. He just looked so proper. proper. And he was making this horrible, horrible meal. And then he mm-hmm. was trying not to gag while making it. And I just, mm-hmm. that was just so funny. And the irony mm-hmm. is that night we had tuna mornay for dinner, which is a, mm-hmm. a good 1970s recipe, and my husband made tuna mornay from my grand's recipe and, Mm -hmm. like, he makes a really – like, he does most of the cooking in our house, makes a really good meal. We all sat down to consume said tuna mornay and it was our Sunday night Bible study meal and he put it down and it was that yellowy-green curry colour and I was like – (laughs) <laughs> well, this is not normal. Like, I'm not, and I go to him, babe. Did you did you put curry powder in the tuna morning? And he went, no, I put mustard powder in. And I'm like, but you had the orange Keens tub thing out. That's curry powder. And he was like, no, no, that was mustard. <laughs> so he's invented. Uh-oh. Was it, it curried? Was curried. He's invented a curry tuna morning, <laughs> and it sounds horrible, but it was actually quite delicious. So, okay. So, what is in tuna mornay? Are you talking like a, a is it pasta noodles or no? Rice? We serve it with rice, but you can serve it with noodles. It's a white sauce okay. base, white roux. Do they call it a roux? Okay. So that's flour, yep. milk, butter. It's got brown mm-hmm. onion fried off in it. Mm-hmm. It's got tuna mm-hmm. from uh, water, like you drain the water and everything, put the tuna in it, mm-hmm. and it's got boiled eggs. And essentially okay. you mix the tuna and the eggs through the roux um, and then you put it in a mm-hmm. baking dish and put breadcrumbs over the top mm-hmm. and sliced boiled eggs and then bake it. Mm-hmm. So I'll put the recipe in. Okay. But we had that when we lived in Canberra, there was a lady, a, a couple at our church who were not were elderly and not healthy and occasionally they do a meal plan that you would, you know, everyone would sign up and take them a meal. And we'd done it we'd done it a couple of times and then I was not well and Grant made tuna mornay and I dropped it around there to them when I was better. And and when I went to pick up the dishes the next time, she raved about it. It was like the best meal she'd ever had. <laughs> and I was like, oh, thanks, it's my mum's recipe and my husband made it. And then she raved for 20 minutes about how wonderful it is to have a husband who cooks and cooks so amazingly and blah, blah, blah. And they were just really lovely. And we found out on Saturday that she's she had passed. And so on Sunday night we made oh. the tuna mornay as a um, a nod to Irene. But, yeah, it was just really uh, funny um, that he made it with curry. So out here you'll find it more as a tuna noodle casserole or a tuna rice casserole. So it'll have the same rice or a pasta, yep. a noodle, and tin tuna, and often peas. Ooh. And in America, usually stuck together with cream of mushrooms, uh, condensed cream of mushroom soup or condensed cream of chicken soup or something like that. It's it's 1970s yeah, food. Yeah, yeah, because it sounds oh, okay. Everybody, yeah, you, you all are looking like <laughs> gag. So, because <laughs> it sounds like, but yeah, we do a curried sausage uh, that that is based on a yeah. condensed chicken soup, mm-hmm. and you put that in with the curry yeah. and the snags. So it sounds like what Grant made was the coronation chicken version of tuna. Yeah, I think. Maybe. I think so. Yeah. Without the raisins. Thank God. Ugh. Been having conversations with people about raisins. I don't like raisins in my food. I think it's like coming across dead flies in my food. Do you? So. I don't want to see raisins in my we food. We have a bit of a chuckle here because um, 
we do a lot of Indian food, obviously, um, given that mm-hmm. there's a, a high migrant population in Australia. And so Indian food is, is much more traditional Indian food now. But in the 70s, Indian food wasn't considered Indian food in Australia unless it had sultanas in it. And so you would yeah, have that would make sense. curry yeah. with sultanas. And I'm just like, ah. mm. But sultanas are better than raisins. In the States, a sultana would be more like a golden raisin. It's larger and plumper, whereas raisins are kind of smaller and harder. And Britain, they're a bit more like currants. So, yeah, I just, I'm not really keen on any of them, to be perfectly honest. Mm. It's like, don't be putting that in my food. But I love a good raisin in a cookie. And I'll, no. Nope. Oh, really? Oatmeal raisin. No. Nope. Yeah, oatmeal raisin. No, nope. I don't want to eat those. Oh, man. I love it. We've got these. Uh, it's kind of, you know, actually, you know what it is. Usually an oatmeal raisin cookie has cinnamon in it, and I just am not keen on cinnamon. Don't put cinnamon in it then. Put nutmeg. Well, yeah, but it still has raisins. <laughs> so it's like, I could nutmeg it. Did nutmeg and chocolate. Oh, there was one in here. I was talking to the pub crowd, and I decided to skip around the book, and I said, oh, I just decided to do one that I thought everybody would like because the next one had... Um, dried cherries in it. And one of the pub crowd was like, thank God you didn't make the dried cherries one. You could not make that one. It's okay if you leave that one out. She doesn't want to see the dried cherry one. So now I have to go find it. But do it. you have, I have a but, an aversion to, what do they call them? Is it glacé cherries? Do you guys get them? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I have an aversion for them. Yeah. I love them. Really? Do you eat them plain? Oh, or yeah. do you have to, like, do they have to be in something? Yes. <laughs> Yes. Okay, so there's this cocktail my friend Matthew gets that has a very boozy cherry on top of it, a cherry that's been soaked in I don't know what. And um, he always lets me steal a cherry off of his drink. It's, no, I it's can't. It's a wonderful I thing. I can't do it. And I think it's because in my experience, glass A cherries used to turn up in fruitcake at Christmas time. You don't like fruitcake? I love fruitcake. I just can't do cherries in fruitcake. They are the best bit of a Christmas fruitcake. But, see, you and I would be good if we we sat beside each other at Christmas. I could just put mine on your plate. You'd get double. I'd be happy. Like bacon. I'd be happy. I don't do bacon either. Which, okay. Now you guys are looking at me like I'm crazy. Yeah, don't do bacon. So my husband's really excited because he gets double bacon. So mm. um, I can't pancetta. I'll do a pancetta in a like a cabanara. Uh, what's the? <laughs> <laughs> that was a. What's the difference? Pancetta's up, Mark. It's thicker. Yeah. It's not, but pancetta doesn't get. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I can't do it. It's too salty. Mm. Oh, no, it's weird. I have a husband that is obsessed with salting everything at least three times. Like when he cooks, so much salt goes in. It's like, and early on in our marriage, he made uh, a dish called salted pork, which was a pork loin covered in like five kilos of salt. And then baked. So it goes hard and crusty. Just like the salt was like really Yeah, thick. like a fish, like when they do fish. Well, like when they do fish. I took one mouthful of that, my lips parked, and I was like, no, nah, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> Toes curled, fell yeah. over. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 he ate the whole thing. But he loves salt and I'm, I mean, I've got high blood pressure. I shouldn't be eating as much salt as he's feeding me. So he has found a solution last week. It's just come in the it just came in the mail. It's a salt that's not salt. So he's now salting with this weird potassium stuff, which gives him his salt fix without killing me. Oh, okay. So is it chemical based or natural? No, no, it's natural based. Oh. It's just a <laughs> he he was a chemistry mind. Yep. Um so yeah, as soon as he was like, as soon as he heard about it, he's like, "Oh yeah, got to try this." Yeah. But yeah, it's a, it's a different sort of potassium than salt. Okay. Um, but it has the same sort of flavour. 
I'll keep you posted. Well, if you don't turn up to the next one, we'll know yeah. that it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, he managed to oversalt me. But my GP, and I don't know whether she was just doing it to make me feel better about being tubby, she said to me that high blood blood pressure and cholesterol they now think might be genetic for some people. And mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, I'll take that. Yep. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, no, yeah. they, they um, so my dad has the same thing that, that I have. I have high highs with my blood pressure and I have low lows. Yes. So – it's definitely hereditary. It, it's not a stable blood pressure. But the high highs, they used to think the low lows were the problem. And then I had a stroke and they're like, oh, maybe the high highs are the problem. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, it's all hereditary. All hereditary. Yeah. And Yay. Well, I used to really limit my salt intake and then I had a heart attack and my cardiologist at the time after running all the invasive tests on me, he's like, you have to salt your food. And I'm like, why do I have to salt my food? You guys are always telling me not to salt things. And they're like, no, you don't, you're not keeping enough hydration in your heart muscle. You have to salt your food. So I got given permission to get back into salt. I still don't salt a lot of things, primarily eggs and avocados. The two things that to me really need to be salted but I'm not really a huge salter. Um, And interestingly enough, you know, I've been a cardiac patient now for hmm, years, 15 years. My new GP asked me what my cholesterol was. And I said, well, I don't know. And she's like, cardio doesn't measure your cholesterol. I said, no, they don't seem to care at all. And she's like, oh no, we need to look at that. And I'm like, cardio doesn't care. (laughs) And cardio doesn't care. And if you get the really smart cardiologists, they realize that cholesterol doesn't actually, unless you're showing signs of blocking, which I don't, I don't block. I just squeeze everything instead. It's not really a critical measurement for me. And she just can't wrap her head around it. I like, you know, she's like, these are the standard tests that we need to run. And I'm like, but cardio doesn't care. <laughs> I like that we're running a bake club and one of us has had a stroke, one of us has had a heart attack, and one yep, of us is mortally obese. So I just kind of go, <laughs> <laughs> we are the poster child for bake club. <laughs> Here, let me make more dessert for you. <laughs> That's so. why I feed it to other people. Yeah. That's how you show love. That's my love language is baking for others. Yes. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Heaven forbid anybody leave my house hungry. Oh, my gosh. And Nick, my husband now, does all the taste tests. Yeah. So I don't even even eat them when they come out of – because I'm trying to cut my sugar. So as soon as they come out of the oven, I walk a little plate and a cookie up to him and then he tells me that it's okay and the rest sort of get bundled <laughs> off and sent to work. <laughs> yeah. I work out. He He's the one that tells me whether I've got the sugar and the salt thing. The balance. Mm-hmm. Has anyone else ever done that where you've put salt in instead of sugar? No. It's just no. Me. Okay, good. Yeah. I mm-hmm. think because. That's a rude I, I I keep them in separate cupboards. I made a cupboards. whole batch of shortbread with uh I made a whole batch of shortbread with no sugar in it once. It was awful. It was dreadful. I mean, even when it was baking, I was like, this doesn't smell right. Nope. Came out of the oven. I realized I hadn't sugared it. It was just basically flour and butter. Mm, Yeah. (laughs) Ooh. Ooh, didn't work. Didn't work. Right, right in the bin. So before we, because we're getting to that time when we should probably wrap it up. But before we do, should we talk quilting? Mm -hmm. Has anyone got anything okay. quilting related that they'd like to share with the group? Made anything? I'm writing a new pattern. Ooh. So your Irish chain pattern just came out. It just did. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's based on a vintage quilt. And so you're writing a new pattern. I'm writing another Slow pattern. Slow down, Sam. And for those of you who know my patterns, it's another 14. 14. So you've got 14 squared which is a square and square you've got 14 on point faster 14 and so what's and there's a churning 14 
Oh, and I, I can't tell you what uh, it is. I can't tell. I don't, I don't say anything until it's released. Because sadly, there are people in our industry that'll pinch your stuff before you get it going. Right. So it's a secret until it, until it leaves the okay. house. So, Kath. But I'm writing a new one for, for Fat Quarters. It's a new Fat Quarter pattern. Oh, and we've got the, um, <laughs> the FPP quilt along. <laughs> the nature quilt along FPP. Yeah. Yeah. Which you can sign up to get. Yeah. So, Kath, now. Shh. Kath. Um, I am currently cutting all my scraps into squares. I've spent hours watching trashy television and cutting them into everything from one and a half inches up to five inches. And what's your plan? So the biggest, I don't have one yet, but they come in handy. Like yeah. I do so many B blocks and things like that. It's great just to have buckets of stuff ready to go, but also instead of having buckets and bags of scraps, I now just have a box of one and a half inch squares, a box of two inch squares, a box of two and a half inch squares, a box of three. You get yeah. the idea. So yeah, it's just been cathartic. Okay. But today, if I was to swing my camera around, I've got all my Ruby Star fabrics out and I'm sorting them into colour. Mm. Order. Mm. And putting them into bins. Binage. Because mm-hmm. I've I've bought so many new fat quarter bundles lately because they keep doing really good stuff and they need to stop doing good stuff because I need to stop buying it. Yeah, okay. Well, you've So if you're listening, please stop making really good fabric. You've cut out sugar, you can keep the fabric. <laughs> you can have the fabric. Thank you. I like that. Okay, I'm going to use that one on my husband. You need something sweet. So, Kath, the quilt I'm making. Kath, the quilt I'm making, I'm using the water fat quarter tower. Nice. The blue one. Mhm. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. the one I'm working. I'm working in. Jeez. And You'll have to have a laugh. Okay, so there are two or three fabrics in the water line that have fish on them. And while I was pushing and pulling and deciding which pieces I was going to take, Megan said to me, is there any possibility of me getting the fish fabrics before Kath sees them? (laughs) Okay, so you all need to know, Kath comes to my house. She says hello to me as she walks into my studio and immediately starts pawing through the fabric drawers to see what else I have that she can steal. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty inconsequential to this. She just is like, hi. And then she's dig, 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 dig. You don't need this. Do you, you don't need, when are you going to use this? I could use this. You don't need this one. Do you? And half of my fabric leaves with her anyway. So all the friends know that Kath gets my fabric, but this time it was like, is there any way that I could have that one before Kath sees it? So I put it aside for her and then that was Megan. And then Marcy came over and she was looking at them and she's like, can I call dibs on that before Kath sees it? <laughs> and I said, well, Megan already called dibs on it. You, you're, you're in line. You need to be like <laughs> Solomon. Cut it in half. I bought, I bought a yard of both of those because they mm-hmm. came in two colorways. They came in a light blue and a dark blue fish. Yeah, the fish? Mm-hmm. The fish. I have a yard of both of them because I know I'm going to use them. Yeah, I haven't okay. bought fabric in ages, but I splurged the last week and bought um, bought some fabric for, oh, surprise, surprise, an upcoming sampler. Oh, awesome. So, yeah, it's been, it's been nice to sew and be excited about sewing for a change. So, um, mm-hmm. but, yeah, there was something I was going to ask. Um, no. And I've been sewing little zippy zippy pouches because I give custom made zippy pouches to all my tour yeah. people. And I've been working on that. Yeah, those. so you must leave soon, yeah? Five weeks. Okay. Six days? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. So Kat's coming back to At least Australia. you guys will be on the same continent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but you're... Yeah. You are going to be in Queensland um, at the start. Yeah. And I I was considering whether I could get my my bottom down that way and catch up with you and Christy. But you're off, like you're off a week later or something, right? Uh, no, the kid's on school holidays now, but mm-hmm. 
the Huz Beast has had a week off, logged back into his account, like logged back into work on the Monday, and today he, like Monday yesterday, and today he flies to Canberra for a week. So I'm like, okay, that wasn't planned mm. at all. And you know what he did to me? Nasty little pasty. Showed me the weather app and Canberra's in single digits and we're in like high 30s. I'm just, I'm like, I'm so jealous that it's going to be cold where you're going. So, yes, it's, uh, yesterday we had a snake in my parents' house. So that was exciting. My dad was sitting in the um, chair, like a lounge chairy thing which is a chair, not a lounge chair like a recliner, but a chair. And he went to stand up. He was reading, went to stand up, looked down as he pushed up, and there was a snake at his foot. <laughs> and so. Okay, I would have had another heart attack on that Well, one. he's had a heart attack. That wouldn't have worked That's for the me. Thing. So he does this. We digress. But he does this thing, right? You guys will feel my pain. My father likes to scare me. So if I'm like walking around the yard or something off in my own little la-la land, he'll walk up behind me and touch me with something to try and make me feel like I've been touched by a snake or a, a goanna or something <gasps> and, like, freak out, right? So one day he was in the garden shed and I snuck up to the garden shed and I jumped out and scared him, Right. And he had this massive reaction, which was glorious, and then he lost it. And he was like, don't scare me. I've got a heart condition. You could kill me. <laughs> and so I for- – like, because I'd forgotten he'd had a heart, heart attack. And so for three days I lived in this perpetual fear and guilt that if he had a heart attack, I would have killed him. And so I was Googling how long after a shock would a heart attack strike because I'm like, what's the window (laughs) where if he has a heart attack I can go, that wasn't me? So we do this thing where he's like, (laughs) "You can." he scares all of us but we can't scare him. So yesterday when they were trying to shush the snake out of the house, my mum, who is braver than I, was in there keeping an eye on it and he walked up behind her and went, touched her with something like poke to try and scare her and she's like oh David and I'm like it's so unfair the man who does it the most none of us can but yeah it was only a baby tree snake made its way out everyone lived to tell the tale but yes it was a funny old maybe after we stop recording I'll give you a few hints and tips for getting back to him (laughs) yeah I have solutions. Before he had a heart attack, I have we solutions. had a very strong back and forth going with setting people up, practical jokes, practical pranks, whatever, between mm. us. And then he had a heart attack and it was and it, it was really funny, at, well, not funny ha, at the time, but he was working for Mount Isa Mines and they have a rule on the mine site that you can't prank anyone because that's how accidents oh, yeah. happen. They find, yeah. yeah, they find that men tend to start off with a basic prank and it escalates and they get more involved oh, and yeah. the risk factors go up and all that sort of stuff. And so he couldn't prank at work, but he likes to do it to his family. So, and it amuses me how funny he thinks it is. Like, just, yeah. But one day what I should do is he should prank me and I should grab my chest and be like. (gasps) Oh, I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. But then he'll be like, that's not funny. You shouldn't make fun of heart attack victims, blah, 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 blah. But, yeah. So that's our house. Oh, you could just say you're making fun of me, not him. (laughs) Yes, Sam said I could. (laughs) But, yes, so (laughs) that's been, oh, and we've got, since last time we talked, we've now befriended two rock wallabies who come and sit on our veranda, our back veranda, and I've been slowly trying to acclimatise them to me because I just want to go pat one, right? That's all I want. But we're having an argument. I named the first one Hudson after Rock Hudson and then Mm -hmm. Grant's now renamed him Dwayne the Rock Wallaby and so (laughs) we can't. And the other one's a girl, right? So we can't call her Hudson. So now we're having this thing about who has naming rights over the rock wallabies. And, but yes, 
It's been an unusual few weeks at our place. So I will take suggestions if you have good rock. We did call Mm. one brick for a while because it liked to sit on the brick, not the rock. So um, Mm -hmm. I should have called it Lego. Oh, that was a missed opportunity. Mm. But, yeah, anyway, so that's our house. But it's been great catching up with you both. I will see you again. I'll see see you again when Kath gets back from down under. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So she gets back. We've got about a week, and then I leave for a month. Just so you know. Okay, so we'll do that. But the other thing I was thinking too, we forgot to talk about, I sent you supplies. So I sent (gasps) after our Milo after our last chat, I sent Sam Milo, which is a malt powdered drink. It was wonderful. I did it in hot milk. Yeah. And then I did it in cookies. It was great. And it makes those malted chocolate cookies in the recipe book. Just spectacular. Mm-hmm. Much better, spectacular. much better. And I shared it with Kath. I did share the Milo with Kath. I still think that you should sprinkle Milo over vanilla ice cream, which is how you eat it as a kid here. Okay. Oh, no, no. And when she – no, sorry. When she says sprinkle, <laughs> if her sprinkle is anything like our sprinkle, it involves heaped tablespoons and mm-hmm. at least eight. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Not my gosh. Eight Heat tablespoons. Your Milo to ice cream <laughs> sort of thing should one to one. be almost one to one. Yeah, but you want okay. just slightly more ice cream. Imagine that pork loin with salt, but ice cream with Milo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then as the ice cream melts, because it melts quickly in Australia, you mix it up. And, oh, mm. I could Milo in milkshakes yeah, as a well. Of Milo. Mm. Milo mm. milkshake. Malted Milo oh, milkshake. Yep. So, and then you said yeah. sprackles. No, freckles. Sprackles. Sprinkles. Freckles. 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 Which were, because mm-hmm. Kath had found a knockoff version of freckles at, a, at an American mm-hmm. store. So I sent you both a bag mm-hmm. of Alan's freckles from Australia, which mm-hmm. I saw, like, seriously, I saw a thing on Facebook, uh, Instagram Reels yesterday of a lady who had a dessert hack and she filled a baking tray with like uh, jars of sprinkles, the round sprinkles, not the oblongy ones. Mm -hmm. And then she dipped, like she spooned drops of melted chocolate in on top of the sprinkles so that, Mm -hmm. yeah, right? Kath's looking at me like. She's making freckles. Yeah, essentially. And then she stuck raspberries in the chocolate or slices of. Uh, strawberry, so that when it set, the okay. strawberries were covered with chocolate and sprinkle. And I'm like, what a waste of so much sprinkle! Because surely you would just put drops mm-hmm. of chocolate on parchment and then sprinkle the sprinkles over the top, so that you could maximize yeah. sprinkle usage. Because she ended yeah. up with a whole baking tray of just decanted sprinkles. That Blast. yeah, like you were just anyway. So I sent you freckles. Mm. Did you like them? Mm-hmm. And um, I haven't tried oh. them yet. Okay. I haven't tried them yet. And Vegemite, Vegemite. which um, the Vegemite was for Kath, and I'm a Marmite fan, but Kath said it was okay to try the Vegemite before I handed it over because I'd never had any. And I like it just fine like I like Marmite. I think Marmite is a little bit stronger. Yeah. It's a teeny bit stronger. I am. And – and I'm used to that. So Yeah, I think that is really a locational thing. Like it's uh mm-hmm. where you were brought up Definitely. type of thing. But um Yeah, I ended up making um, you know, a bit of bread and marmite for our friend Marcy Calf, because she was like, Well, how do you eat marmite? So I did it for her and she took one bite and she was like, Yeah, I don't think so. So um <laughs> I forgot to tell you at the time, to make a good gravy, despite what Paul Kelly says, a teaspoon of Vegemite in your gravy. Helps give it a bit of. Mm, Kath does that all the time. See, are you Australians? We know. Yeah. Um, and just to circle yeah. back to the freckles, also good in ice cream. <laughs> also good in ice cream. Okay. <laughs> so what you're telling me is I'm not eating enough ice cream. <laughs> what I'm, what okay. I'm revealing is that I probably sure eat I too work much. On that. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to get really creative, yeah. you take a freckle and a little teaspoon of ice cream and put it on the top of the freckle and then another freckle and you make an ice cream freckle sandwich. 
<laughs> See? Tiny one. That's next level. Yeah. That's next level. But freckles, if okay. you get a cookie, a vanilla a base cookie thing, you can push a freckle into the top of the cookie and bake it and they're mm-hmm. nice baked. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Yeah. One thing you can do if you want a relatively easy but different dessert to play around with, Get the Oreo cookies, preferably the double stuff because they're a little thicker. And you can put um, a lolly stick, a um, lollipop stick up into the cookie and then dip that in chocolate and, and then dip that in other things, which, I mean, if you like did a chocolate dipped Oreo with freckles all over it, it could probably be pretty yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm going to need a moment. <laughs> I'm just writing all this down. Okay. Um, so... On that note, I will see you guys in a few weeks' time. Kath, travel safe. Yeah. Thank you. Enjoy being back home. And, yeah, I'm going to stop recording now. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Fussy Cutters podcast. Enjoyed listening? Why not subscribe so you'll never miss an episode? Did you know the quickest way to the heart of any podcaster is to leave a review or recommend the podcast to a friend? It's true. It is. Until next week, get out there and fondle that fabric.